Spencer Bunny here from Between the Lions. You're watching Nostalgia Time with James Nobes. I got to get a new job. <laughs> Thank you, announcer Bunny, for that uh, great uh, introduction. Uh, hello, did, friends. Did I, did, I, did I get it right? Uh, nostalgia Talk, but you nostalgia were pretty close. Talk. I stink. It's it's okay. That that was pretty good. Uh, so thank you for that great introduction. And hello, friends, and welcome to episode number seventy-eight of Nostalgia Talk, and also the first one of the year, twenty twenty-four. You guys know me. I'm James. New year, same old host. And joining me is my buddy Peter Lins. Good to see you again, Peter. Nice to see you again, James. No, I haven't seen you since that time way back at D23 in 1704, whenever it was that we saw each other. That's right, yes. Yes, Peter and I uh, have met before. Uh, we met at the D23 Expo in Anaheim, California. I, of course, was there for the Muppets and all the animation stuff. And um, I saw Steve Whitmire, Dave Goles, Bill Beretta, Matt Vogel, and Eric Jacobson doing all of their characters. Uh, none of Peter's characters were there, but... I spotted him walking by, he walked right past me. I'm like, mom, that's one of the Muppet guys. That's Peter Lenz. And my mom's like, how do you know that? And I was like, I've, I've seen what these people look like. I've emailed Peter before and I introduced myself. I was like, excuse me, is your name Peter Lenz? And he said, yes, it is. I was like, my name is James Nobes. And he just was starstruck by this fan. Like normally it would be the other way around. He was like, wow, the no. James Nobes from Nova Scotia. Yeah. It was very starstruck. I still am. I haven't yeah. quite gotten over it. Well, now because of Peter, my Instagram name is the James Nobes. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, wow. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and for anybody who doesn't know, Peter is a puppeteer, not just a puppeteer. Like we've had a ton of puppeteers on Nostalgia Talk before, but he is the puppeteer for a lot of the most iconic and most recognizable Muppet characters, including for the Muppets franchise, Walter, Statler, Robin the Frog, Link Hogthrob, and Lips, Lips the Trumpet Player who is currently quite the breakout star on The Muppets Mayhem on Disney Plus now. Go watch it. Uh, he was Tutter and Pip on Bear in the Big Blue House. And on the non-Muppet series Between the Lions, you just heard announcer Bunny, but he was also Theo Lion. And on Sesame Street, he currently performs Ernie and my favorite, Harry Monster. You got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about all of them. Hi, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I just totally... I just totally geeked out as soon as I heard Harry there. Cause you know, I, and like Peter had the part of Harry, like after I had gotten to know him. And so like, I think that this is, you know, we, our friendship grew from meeting each other at D23 and then hearing that he got a lot of these classic characters that I mentioned in the intro, you know, we became a lot closer. I remember I was like, dude, you're doing my favorite Muppet. I was just like totally geeking out over the fact that, one of my friends is doing my favorite my favorite character on Sesame Street. I still love seeing that character in new stuff. Uh, and I'm even more happier to be chatting with my buddy Peter again. So good to be chatting with you today. Swell to be chatting with you as well, James. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's get st uh, also, how were your holidays? I forgot to ask you that. Uh, it, they were great. I, I was uh, I spent them in with my with my new wife, uh, Alice, in, in our home in Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, it was it was lovely. Um, and uh, yeah, it was the first year. It was the first year I wasn't celebrating Christmas with my kids. They were back home here in New York uh, with their their dear friend and, and cousin. And they, I was so proud of them. They they totally put on the traditional Christmas they've always known, but they did it without me. But uh, so it was sad to be apart from them. But you know, they're adults, and it's it's tough for them to get enough time to get away to travel all the way across the country for any meaningful amount of time. So anyway, they did it up right here. I was I was just so proud of them. But hopefully we're planning on all being together next year. But thanks for asking. How were, how were yours? Mine were a lot of fun. Um, we uh, basically had a lot of family coming in and out of my house for two whole days. It was two. And some of sometimes even the same people were coming because uh, we had leftovers and we're like, hey, it's leftover night. Anybody want to come? And it was just two days of full on gift exchange, which was a lot of fun. Uh for all of us, um, my sister and her girlfriend were here. I call them the girlies. And in fact, on I'm like, hey, girlies. And on my uh, gift from them, it even said to James from the girlies. Oh, nice. So they've they've adopted. They've embraced it. <laughs> yeah. It's, my family says hello, by the way. Hi, family. <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, it was a nice uh, holiday season. And uh, 
yeah, hope that uh, 2024 is off to a good start for you and also for our listeners as well. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's begin with how did you become interested in puppetry and when did you realize that it was what you wanted to do? Uh, I don't know the exact moment I became interested in puppetry. I kind of came out of the womb uh, wanting to be a puppeteer. Of course, it helped that I was you know exactly the the uh, I was target audience for Sesame Street when it premiered, and my family was behind it. They they tell me that we all sat around and watched the first episode together. Of course, I was pretty little, so I don't remember that exact moment. But um, yeah, I there was a little squirrel puppet, a little mohair squirrel puppet uh, that was in my preschool, and it was my favorite toy. And I loved being able to make the other kids laugh with the antics I would create with this little puppet. But it wasn't until I was, oh, somewhere between eight, nine, ten years old, somewhere in that neighborhood that, uh, you know, I, I had been doing puppet shows at birthday parties and, and certainly doing a lot of puppet shows for my family, hiding behind the sofa and doing a puppet show anytime we had company. Um, but uh, I had watched a lot of TV in the 70s and all the dads on all the sitcoms and cartoons I watched hated their work, hated their boss, was afraid of their boss. <laughs> and it got my little child like mine thinking, well, when I'm a grown up, I want to have a job that I that I like going to. And what would that be? And then I was like, oh, yeah, duh, I'm going to be I want to be a puppeteer on Sesame Street with the Muppets. And uh I forgot about it for a minute and went to college and got a bachelor's in psychology. But uh, halfway through my junior year, I remembered like, no, I, I don't want to be a, a psychologist. I want to I want to wiggle dolls on TV and movies. So uh, and I got in incredibly lucky. I, you know, the thing is, I couldn't I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. Like I wouldn't accept any anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say I didn't, you know, work like in high school. Yeah, I was a, a waiter and worked at a men's formal wear store. And, you know, in college, I delivered pizzas for Domino's. I did all that stuff, but but I was always just laser beam focused on on getting to do what I've been doing for many many years, and That's I've been awesome. incredibly lucky and fortunate that I, I get to do just that. Mm. So, was Sesame Street like your first professional puppeteering gig from that? Uh, I suppose it well it was my first professional television gig. I I suppose my first professional was uh, gig was uh, right out of college. I was an intern at at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, and okay. after the internship program, yeah, I was assistant to the museum director. I was a museum docent and an usher in the theater. Uh, but the second year, um, I got to be one of their touring puppeteers with their production production of Pinocchio. And we toured for like eight months around the eastern half of the U.S. And I guess that was my first technically professional gig. But but my first like, you know, big professional thing, yes, was Sesame Street uh, the next the following year. So how did you get on that show? So after, while I was working in the museum, uh, it was the first time that that Jim was going to sell the Muppets to Disney, the time that it, it didn't go through. And they, they thought they were going to be opening studios in Orlando and they needed puppeteers in the South for all the productions they were going to do down there. So they went around uh, auditioning people in the South. Kevin and Steve, Kevin Clash and Steve Whitmire came to the Center for Puppetry Arts in the, gosh, it must have been the summer of 1990. And uh, my friend Robin, who I'm still very dear friends with, told me about it. And she's like, they use monitors. Like, what do you mean they use monitors? There's no internet then, you know, this, I, and I'm also, I'm not very smart. So it's like, I thought it was just, hey, I'm a puppet, but no. So she came over to my parents' house and where I was living, of course, it was right out of college. And uh, I had my animal, my Fisher Price animal puppet with the eyebrow mechanism. And she brought this old security camera. She got like at a yard sale or a, a whatever. Anyway, they were selling a security camera at a yard sale. Wow. Well, you know, it's just, just an old, you know, this old school, I'm talking, this is the late 1980s, right? So it's just, mm -hmm. it's this big chunky thing that you could plug into a TV and hey, you can see what you're doing. Anyway, uh, I auditioned for them there and they just had us do very simple things. And um, sorry, you're asking how I got that gig with Sesame. So it goes all the way back to that summer of 1990 and that first audition. Well, uh, actually, right before before then, I can't remember before after, but Jim passed away, and a few months later, they decided to go ahead with these auditions anyway, just to see who was out there and you know see what they could find. So, so I did that audition, and I got invited down to it's Disney Hollywood Disney's Hollywood Studios today, but back then it was Disney MGM Studios, mm -hmm. and uh, for a five day workshop with with Kevin and Steve, um, and. Uh, 
yeah, so I asked Kevin at that workshop, what do I need to do to get, because I really want to do this for a living. And he said what I, the advice I've given many up and coming puppeteers is, you know, get a camera you can hook up to a TV or a computer these days. Uh, find a puppet with a mouth that moves and eyes that can appear to focus right down the barrel of the lens and practice all the stuff we've been learning at this workshop. And the next time one of these things comes along, you'll be that much better and maybe that much more likely to land a job, who knows. So the following year, I went on tour with the Center for Puppetry Arts and uh, on Pinocchio tour. But the second I got back from that workshop in Orlando, uh, I, bought a, I bought a giant camcorder, which I actually I still have, takes full-size VHS cassette tapes. And nice. every hotel we stayed in, uh, I hooked it up to the TV and I had a couple of puppets and I practiced for that entire tour. I was practicing. Following summer, 1991, uh, there was the first what became annual uh, puppetry workshop at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center up in Waterford, Connecticut. And it was billed as a workshop for professional puppeteers who want to expand their knowledge of TV puppetry. And half the workshop was learning how to build puppets for television, and the other half was manipulating for doing puppetry for camera. And it was taught by Marty Robinson, who does Telly Monster and Snuffleupagus, and Kathy and also Mullen. and also uh, yeah. Marty was a uh, previous guest on this show. Oh, he was excellent twice. Yeah, so it was Marty. Oh, wow. So it was I, Marty. I did. I it's it's funny. I did a retrospective on Sesame Street doing Slimy Goes to the Moon, and since Marty is slimy, I asked him and also Lou Berger, who was a friend of mine and uh, was head writer at the time. I was like, "Do you That's guys right. want to come back and do this retrospective with me?" And uh, so they came back. Oh, very cool. That's I was actually so just talking to Marty last week. Nice. Well, it was Marty and Pam and Kathy Mull and Pam Arciero. Uh, Another friend of friend. this podcast, too. Oh, sure. And and then uh, and Kathy Mullen. Uh, and uh, and then there was the, the workshop side of it. And I, I'm a lousy puppet builder. I have no I have tremendous respect for the for the workshop and the people that build the puppets. They are insanely talented and don't don't get nearly enough recognition. They're, but they are true artists. They really are. I don't have that. I'm, I cannot build it. I just don't have the patience or skill or ability or anything. But um, but the manipulation side, I had a lot of fun with. And actually, there was quite a few puppeteers there who went on to do other things. There's Besides me, there was Tim Lagasse, who's a very accomplished puppeteer and, and builder and creator, director uh, in L.A. Uh, uh, Heather Ash uh, was part of that workshop. Mark, Mark Gale of Dylan Gale Puppets and Frank the Horse was at that workshop. Um, uh, Allison Mork, who was Cherry on Pee Wee's Playhouse, among other other characters, I think was yeah, of course Allison was there. Um, anyway, it was kind of a who's who. But day one, I remember Marty saying to all of us, "Muppets is not hiring. This is not an audition. This is just to give you another tool in your toolkit of being a puppeteer." But apparently, they went when the workshop was over. Uh, oh, and Jane Henson was also one of the teachers, and Richard Termini. But anyway, they, they went back to New York and were asked, so was anybody any good? And they had a list of names and my name was one of the ones that came up. And they remembered me from the workshop the previous year. So uh, I got a phone call, God, within a week after getting home saying, hey, we want you to come up to Sesame Street and audition. And there is your very, very long-winded, all over the place answer to how did I get hired by Sesame Street? There's way too many details. That's how it happened. And you did a lot. And in that, uh, in those first few years of Sesame Street, you did like a lot of one shot characters or right hands or background characters. A lot of right hands. My gosh, my first seven years on Sesame Street, it was background and right hand, which was, which was actually the kind of the traditional way that Jim used to bring new people in. Richard Hunt was that way too. For years, he did nothing but backgrounds and right hands before he was allowed to say anything. Even Frank Oz, you know, well, he didn't want to do anything <laughs> before he found out that he had a voice and was a, a hysterical and an actor and created brilliant characters. Uh, unfortunately, today's puppeteers that are coming and the people we're training now don't have that luxury so much. They're handed a character. It's like, okay, go, 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 be brilliant. And it's really hard. It's really difficult to do that. But yes, for years, I, I just did one-offs uh, until I, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons behind me going off and doing shows like Puzzle Place on PBS back in the mid nineties and, uh, and Bear in the Big Blue House and later Lions is because you know, Sesame had its set characters and it was really, really difficult to get a new character on the show. Um, so because, you know, all the, the originators of those characters were still there or every, everything was taken, really. So um, I was really fortunate in that I got to go off and do these other series and actually be able to uh, create new characters, which is what I love doing. 
I'm glad you brought up the puzzle place and bear in the big blue house. Cause I was going to ask, uh, was the puzzle place uh, or was it bear in the big blue house? I, I can't tell. I can't remember uh, which one it was, but one of those, was that like the first time you had like a regular character on a show? It was puzzle place. Yeah. Okay. Puzzle place was the first time I had a, a major reoccurring character on a nationally syndicated television show. Okay. And with bear yeah. in the big blue house, like, was that the first time you had a regular character on a Muppet show? Yes, actually, I remember. I remember Noel Noel McNeil, who plays Bear, and who's a, a director now, a fantastic director uh, with Sesame Street now. Um, Noel saying, "You know, technically, we're Muppet performers now. This is a Muppet show. We, these are these characters are Muppets, and you know, it was fun thinking of them like that. It was it was it was difficult thinking about them like that because, well, where's Miss Piggy and Kermit? You know, where's where's Cookie Monster? But uh, but yeah, he was technically absolutely there. They're, they're Muppet characters." So for that being like your first original Muppet character that uh, you got to do as a regular mm -hmm. on a show, how did you get that part? It was an audition. Uh, <laughs> they were auditioning. I don't know if they, I, I imagine they were auditioning. Yeah, they, I think they were auditioning people in LA, but there's a lot more character uh, puppeteers in New York at that time. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was a big uh, audition process. So we'd get, you know, they'd send us pictures of the characters and sides, you know, scripts kind of telling us what the character was like, and we had to go in and put the puppet on and try some scenes and whatnot. Anyway, uh, yeah, I got, uh, I got hired for, and at that point it was just a pilot. It wasn't even definitely going to be a series. It was just a pilot, which I believe you can find online if you look for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I played a mouse named Mouse, <laughs> who was a girl, a female character. Oh. They decided that they would just be a boy. Same, same voice, same character, same. I was, I, was, I was wondering that because the voice for Tutter is because I, I've been rewatching a little bit of Bear in the Big uh -huh. Blue House, getting ready for this, especially now that's on Disney Plus. All you listeners out yeah. there, if you have a Disney Plus account, you know what to do. Um, like the voice is very, very high pitched. Um, mm -hmm. I have a friend whose name is Laura Faye Smith. She's a voice actress who's done like video games and anime, and she was saying that uh, she's done a lot of male characters because. They're younger characters that she does. So it's easy for her to like get in that range. And like for you with uh, with Tutter, it's a little bit higher. So it, if it was a female character, like, of course, same voice. Yeah, yeah. I, th I mean, yeah, I didn't change anything. Oh, what the notes I got after the pilot, they wanted they wanted to lose any kind of a New Yorky accent because in the pilot, Tutter had a lot, a lot of that kind of thing going on. Uh, <laughs> so we got rid of some of that. I kept a little of it. Thank you, Pia. You know, Bia is still there, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't. I didn't even I just, think of that as a New York accent. I just thought of that as a kid well, with it's not. speech. It yeah. was just. It was. Yeah, no. That's and that's what it was. But I'm saying in the pilot, it was a lot stronger. Okay, <laughs> it cool. was a lot. It was a lot more present. And then also for the pilot, I did well. Joey Mazzarino uh, was the other otter, and but he wasn't available for the series. But it was it was Pummel and Pop instead of Pip and Pop. Ah, yeah, that's right. Pummel and Pop. Mm -hmm. I, I had uh, Noel and also Mitchell Kriegman on the show, oh. and um, I was talking to them both about like impactful moments on Bear in the Big Blue House. What What do you think are some of the most impactful moments from that show? <laughs> the potty episode, for sure. That was brought up a lot. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a big deal. That was a big award winner, and that was uh, yeah, that was oh, I uh, about what nine years ago, eight or nine years ago. Uh, we were working on this, uh, oh, that ABC, that Muppet ABC series back in 2015, mm -hmm. and Reese Witherspoon was a guest star. And somehow, I don't know, someone had told her, whatever, she found out that I was Tutter from Baron Blue House, and she's like, oh my gosh, I totally use that to toilet train my kids. And, and she, at the time, she had a, a younger child, and she's like, I can't find it, it's not on DVD anywhere. And of course, it was, I don't know that if, if it is on DVD, but anyway, but that was very sweet. It's like, Reese Witherspoon used the potty episodes to, to toilet train her kids. That's awesome. <laughs> so I think that was impactful. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, we, we had a lot of ambitions in that show. I mean, there was a show that to try to make kids not afraid of getting shots. And That's just what I was thinking about over. too. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think I mentioned to you that a friend of mine from college, uh, Noel had messaged me. I was, uh, I was in class and I got a message from Noel and, during break from class, I looked behind my classmate. And I was like, oh, I just got a really nice message from Noel McNeil. And they're like, I don't know who that is. And I said, oh, well, he's Bear from Bear in the Big Blue House. And as soon as I said that, my classmates went crazy. And uh, uh, she, one of the, one of my classmates, her name is Drew. She was telling me that um, she had a little Tutter doll. 
and uh, oh. she was going to get her vaccination and uh, she brought it with her thinking of just say ow and I thought to myself well do you want me to tell Tutter that personally and she just looked at me like <laughs> what and I'm like I have his contact information in my phone I can share that with him <laughs> and I I used it not too long ago as well because a couple of months ago I got my uh, fourth COVID vaccine and I'm I'm nervous around needles. Uh, I didn't think I would because I'm in my younger my uh, mid twenties. That makes me feel old. Um, but because I'm in my mid twenties, I um, I wasn't sure if I would need a fourth COVID vaccine. And then everybody in my house was getting colds, and I was like, you know what? Maybe I should just to be cautious. And, yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly what what uh, what happened. You know, like uh, they put it in. And I was like, ow, and then it was done. So just say ow. It totally works. So was impactful. Brushing your teeth. I know. Remember Mitchell wanting to make uh, clean up that cleaning be fun. So the whole clean up the house song, <laughs> clean up the house, <laughs> everybody clean up the house. Hey, baby, let's go. I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah. Gosh, we even dealt with homelessness with Jack the dog, a Christmas episode, and <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> they tackled some tough things uh, there. Mm -hmm. So uh, you also did Muppets from Space. You are in that film in yeah. way, in more ways than one, might I add. Can I tell you, I've never, that was the most nervous. I think that was the absolute most nervous I've ever been in my entire professional career. What was, was the, that was, cameo? Was the, this being hippie number two. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was what it was written in I the script, this hippie number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think John Kennedy was hippie number one. Or maybe Drew was hippie number one. I can't remember. But anyway. Well, originally, you know, the, the the producers and all, I don't know whose decision it was, they wanted Bill and Steve and they wanted the regular and Jerry, the regular guys to have cameos. And they're like, I, well, I remember Bill especially. Like, no, 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 I don't want to. I mean, it, it should be these guys. So uh, give the newbies Bill a chance. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, that was terrifying. Mm -hmm. But they used my ad lib. You know, I, I said, I think the line was, hey, wait a minute. I believed you was the line. And I said, hey, hey, wait a minute. I believed you, man. I added the man, you see. That was my what? big improv. That was my well, big improv moment right there. Well done. Because like that, a, a hippie would absolutely say that. So I, make it real. It made it. It made the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I know. It's pretty good. Please don't send me your pictures to autograph. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> well, Ricky Boyd uh, and I, he's a, been a mentor of mine ever since I started creating things. Like before I even got into film school, like he... Uh, you know, he has helped me along the way. He and, oh, Mark, awesome. wow. he and Marty and Stephanie DeBruzzo and Lou as well. They've all been huge, huge helps to me. And uh, I was talking to Ricky about that cameo in Muppets from Space. And uh, he was like, oh, God, I hate being on camera and the makeup. I look like Boy George <laughs> with a kitchen colander on my head. <laughs> Ricky looks great in that. He looks amazing. Well, he also, I, I just, yeah. <laughs> he also he also praised you and John Kennedy for filling in for Frank. I will say, doing Piggy and Fozzie. Yeah, that was um, that was that was pretty cool because originally Steve Wimmeyer was was filling in for Frank with Piggy, and he really did not want to do it. And I was like, oh well, I, he's like, you you want to do it? And he's like, here, it's yours. And I remember Bill, Bill was so you know, Bill has since become a very dear one of my best friends, but but back then I didn't really know him. But he was so kind and sweet. He's like, you sure you're up for this? I was like, yeah, I, I can do this. He said, okay. That was great. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, that was fun. I did Piggy for almost that whole film. Not not quite. There's some scenes Frank was there for. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. But you were there to, uh, but you were there to beat up Andy McDowell. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I get to beat up Andy McDowell. <laughs> that that uh, I can imagine that that must have been fun. Uh, mostly for Piggy because we all know how feisty she gets. <laughs> Sure, sure. <laughs> and that and that was and that was your first film, and you got to do or rather fill in for this iconic Muppet character. That's that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And then flash forward uh, years later, when they make the next Muppet movie, uh, you get not only uh, a new character but also pretty much the star, Walter. Uh, you know the 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 huge Muppet fan who becomes a big. Uh, part of the Muppets by being a fan, just by being passionate right. about it. How did you get the role of Walter? I've heard, you, I've heard you tell me before about the audition process. Yeah, it was, it was the same kind of thing, like, uh, or just about any of the characters I've got. Not all of them are auditions, but, but yeah, Walter was, it was a major audition. Uh, they were auditioning puppeteers on the East and West coast and not just puppeteers, but improv people, people that might have a knack for puppetry. 
Um, oh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, and it was the same kind of thing where we got like a character description and I think there was a sketch of the character and a few of the sides. Um, and I remember going into the city and uh, got everybody, and, and men and women too, they're just auditioning everybody for this role. And uh, gosh, I don't know, a week or two after that first audition, I got a call from Debbie McClellan, who was the head of Muppet Studios at the time. She said, well, there's, she's like, they want you to come for a callback audition. Uh, they want to they fly you to LA for a callback. Um, and, and it was, I think it was down to me, Kevin Clash, Joey Mazzarino, I believe Matt Vogel. Um, was that it? I think that was it. And she said, nobody gave them what they were looking for, but the four of you came closest. And I said, well, what, I think I asked her, what, what should I do differently? What, you know, what, what are they looking for? And she said, well, uh, the one thing I can tell you is they said that if Mike, if the actor, Michael Sarah was, uh, if, if the role, sorry, if the role were going to be cast as a human, that Michael Sarah would already have the job. So that told me, oh, they're looking for a Michael Sarah type. Uh, so I just started watching every Michael Sarah TV and project and film I could watch and binging them and watching his scenes and started to think about, you know, I was entertained by them, but then I started thinking about what he was saying as a script. And those were actually words on a page and how he was interpreting those words and his delivery. And, and also started thinking about who Walter was outside of the script. Like, well, what does this guy do in his spare time? And of course he's, you know, he, had, he writes fan fiction and he's on all these on tough pigs and all the fan sites all the time. <laughs> and that actually came up in during the, there was a part of the audition with Jason was, uh, was improv. And, um, and there was also a song we got to sing a duet. Anyway, it was, it was great fun. And uh, yeah, so I just, I kind of, I remember we, I, I flew out to LA with Ke Kevin and I were on the same flight and we're in the same hotel. And, and I've stayed in that hotel many times since. I was like, that's the room where I got the job. But there was like a little conference room on the first floor uh, where uh, James Bobin, the director was and Jason Siegel and some of the producers and Debbie McClellan. Anyway, um, yeah. And it was some, it was quite some time after that, that I got the phone call. I think we were actually, my, my now late wife and I were visiting her sister in, in Georgia and, uh, and I got the phone call that I'd gotten the job. That's amazing. Um, and, and I should also say that Walter, you know, yeah, he's, he's kind of the lead, at least for the first half of that film, the, the original script, he wasn't, he was part of it for sure. Uh, but he kind of became the main focus um, during reshoots. It wasn't even during the regular filming that he was the main focus. It was during the reshoot period months later, you know, they cut together the film and they'd shown it to, to the brain trust at Pixar and other people. And they're like, so that's that. And then you can tweak a film after it's made, you can go back and do reshoots, get some things you missed, tweak the story a little bit. So um, there was a lot that happened during those reshoots that, that made Walter the focus for the first half of the film. So, you know, when I first got the part, it was a huge deal. Yay, I'm a Muppet in this movie, this, this movie with the Muppets and Jason, I get to do this new character, but it wasn't the, this is all about you. That, ha that didn't happen until much, much later. So Walter, like vocally is just like your speaking voice. Is that what yeah. you were told to do? No, so, well, oh, okay. eventually. So with the Michael Sarah thing, you know, I, I did the voice. I tried to do my, my best Michael Sarah impersonation, which is pretty terrible, um, but it got me the job. And during one of the first table reads, we we're just about to go into production. And Bill said at the table read, he said, you know, the, this puppet looks like he's not a kid, right? He's probably in his 20s. The character's supposed to be in his 20s. And he's not a little boy, kind of, but he kind of looks like a little boy. And with the voice that you're doing, the vocal quality is kind of like a little boy. He said, you've got it. And he said to the group, to the table, like, you know, Peter's got a young sounding voice anyway. Pete, what if you just used your own voice? Let's, let's read a couple of scenes where you do that. And I was like, okay <laughs> one of the one of the one of the things that drew me to puppetry and one of the things i like about it is being able to hide this away and you know and put whatever into a uh, uh something else another figure hey look at this don't look at me so i felt really really exposed i was like this you want this voice coming out of a that's gonna be weird that's is that what the so it was really challenging but i mean i did it i did the table read and everyone was like like yes that do that Mm -hmm. okay and i remember the first month of production at least like i kept i would kept slipping into a little and bill's like oh, is he sounding like a little kid oh, just 
keep it, you know, keep it down low, keep it like yourself. Mm-hmm. So it was a huge, that part was very challenging, but I, I did it, you know, and, and now, now I have it in my repertoire. Now I can do characters. That sound. I'm doing it now with uh, Julia's dad on Sesame street. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Uh, I, like, I'm able to recognize uh, any. I mean, I'm able to recognize most Muppet voices. I know that it's. Right. I, I I know that nobody can see it, but I was using air quotes uh, because, as we all know, puppeteering is more than just doing a voice. Like, I when I tell people I know Peter and Marty and Steve and Matt and Bill and all those those guys, they're like, "Oh, it's so cool that you talk to the people who do the voices. The voice is what we hear, but it isn't what we see or think about usually." Uh, Mm -hmm. And so like when I like I remember there was an episode of Sesame Street where it was Halloween and Elmo had this like uh, astronaut outfit on based on something that he was really into. And he met another kid who you had performed who was into the same thing that had like a costume like three times as better. And (laughs) essentially it was um, the voice of Walter or should I say voice of you rather. Yeah, or the carrot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just kind of like a kid voice, but yeah. But now I have access to that, so now it's not. It's nice. It's nice to be able to do that. I mean, Noel did the same thing with Bear. You know, right? Basically, just Uncle Noel. Uh, so yeah, it's it's good. Have, but but you know, most of the time I prefer talking like you know somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am glad you brought up the uh, Muppets uh, film, uh, which is probably the best Muppet film that there is. Actually, like you, you all did a phenomenal job, not just on that film, but bringing back those characters to people who knew who they were from their childhoods, especially with the plot of the film, doing the Muppet show again and bringing them to a wider audience. Uh, another friend of mine is Paul McGinnis. Oh, and, yeah. and, he, <laughs> and he told me that um, during production in LA, uh, when they were shooting that little scene with Feist, you, mm. him, Tyler Bunch, and Matt Vogel, and Feist all went out for pizza in Paul's parents' minivan, and and, and David Rudman too. I think oh, was there. Oh, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't tell me that David was there, but I, I think I'm pretty sure David's there too. He well, he told me that um, once uh, you had dropped Feist off, which is very lucky that Paul knew where she <laughs> she lived. You were like, I was just in the back of a minivan with Leslie Feist. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so, well i was thinking it was about so that. fun we were just hanging out with her she was so cool you know well, i was i was thinking about that because great. she she's from here nova scotia yeah and she was oh. just she was just in town this summer for the jazz festival oh you know okay I, I i went to the jazz festival but i didn't see her i saw mr lava lava shaggy all right then <laughs> I saw I saw her perform years ago at Radio City Music Hall. It was so fun. She's just fantastic in concert. Mm, I bet. Um, now now I wish I had great. seen her last summer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You do actually. She's really fun in concert. Mm-hmm. So, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. No. Nothing. Carry on. Okay. So, what was it like to film Muppets Most Wanted around Europe? Oh, that was a blast. We weren't really around. We were, it was all, it was all London. It was all okay. London and, and the area around London. I mean, they went back, you know, the, uh, the uh, second unit and got shots in other places, but no, that was all, that was all England. Cold. It was very, very cold. Um, uh, it was, it was fun. You know, we got to live in, live in London in the winter, which was, wasn't the most pleasant, but it was so cool to be there for a few months. And, uh, and my family came out and stayed w- uh, with me for part of the time. And, uh, we had to spend Easter weekend in Paris, which was not a good idea because it was just crowded and very, very cold. But um, <laughs> but no, filming was great. We were out at Pinewood Studios and we did a bunch of stuff on location as well. Um, yeah, that was that was a that was a fun film. And awesome. we got to meet and begin, you know, get become close with uh, with uh, Ricky Gervais and Ty Burrell. And uh, well, and, and I, of course, I'd worked with Tina Fey many times at this point. And <laughs> anyway, all those guys. All of That's our, awesome. All of our cameos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, how did you get the roles of, you probably saw this coming from me, Ernie and my boy Harry on Sesame Street? Because like, cause of course, Harry was um, kind of like pushed to the background in a lot of episodes before. Didn't really, like a character would yeah. go by him and it would be like, hi, Harry. And you could still hear Jerry going, oh, hi. But he was not involved in any of the plots now. He's been brought back as this. I mean, some kids are going to be like, who's that blue guy? I've never seen him before. Uh, yeah, a friend, yeah. One of my friend's kids was like, I've never seen that puppet before. And I'm like, ah, I have. That was 20 years ago. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm trying to I'm trying. We're trying to get him in there more often. 
I, I just love that guy so much. Uh, it, it, similar answer to the others, you know, it was an audition process. Now with Sesame, um, they don't do huge auditions. And oftentimes it's just an internal audition, like amongst the puppeteers that we already have. We already have such an incredible group of people that know the characters so well um, that we don't usually look too far beyond our, our core group. Um, and that's that's how it was with Harry. So I auditioned and, and got that. Uh, and then for Ernie, that was kind of a roundabout thing. It was, I actually had auditioned for Ernie years ago and the, our puppet captains, you know, Marty and, and, uh, and Matt Vogel wanted me to be Ernie. Eric Jacobson, who performs Bert, wanted me to be Ernie. And there was this whole audition process and callbacks and callbacks again. And then they had, they asked me, they said, well, the producers don't know that you're up for this. Can you put a, a reel together showing them what you've done? And by the way, this is after Baron's Big Blue House, after Puzzle Place, after, after uh, the Jason Siegel film. <laughs> and like, they don't know if I can do a character. Okay, well, they can look it up on YouTube. But I, I said, okay, fine, I'll put together a reel. And then ultimately, they decided to not go with me um, because they had somebody doing a voice for Ernie for the uh, for the touring show. It was just a pre-recorded voice. Well, if this person can do a voice, maybe they can be a puppeteer. So they tried that for a little while. Was it Billy? And, uh, yeah. Another good and, friend of uh, another good friend of mine. Uh, he uh, wanted me to say hello. By the way, he is the sweetest guy. And he really so is. Yeah, yeah. He's a good guy. It wasn't really fair to put him in that position. Anyway, it didn't work out. And and uh, Matt, this is you know years after the other those producers. By the way, that made that decision to hire him are long gone, and uh, it's a totally different team now. But Matt's still there, and Matt said. I'm not asking. I'm I'm telling them this isn't working. Peter needs to do it. So that's what happened. That's how that's how I eventually got Ernie. <laughs> um, Bill, Billy yeah. Billy was saying um cuz like I I brought our our friendship up. I said to uh Billy, dude, I hope that this doesn't put you in an awkward position at all. Uh you don't have to talk about what got you to leave Sesame Street if you don't want to. He did. He was very very nice about it. Oh. Um, and then I I told him that I'm friends with you and then he said, "Well, Peter is an amazingly talented performer. If it can't be me and if it can't be Steve, I'm glad it's Peter. Oh, that's lovely. That's a love. I'm thank you for sharing that with me because I haven't I haven't spoken. I had sent him a note after it all happened, and, but I never heard from him. So uh, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. You're very welcome. So this is kind of a deep cut question uh, with taking over Harry and Ernie. Uh, I know that you didn't get to work with Jim Henson. But right. I do know that you got to work with Jerry Nelson. And I've heard Matt talking before about him working with Jerry uh, very closely. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gave him the confidence to take on uh, the Count and Floyd and Sherlock Hemlock and a bunch of those other characters. I've heard David talk about working with Richard, which gave him the confidence to take on Scooter, Janice Beaker, Sully, Two-Headed Monster. I've also heard Steve talk about working with Jim, which gave him the confidence to do Kermit and Ernie and a bunch of these others. Uh, do you feel that there was a difference individually taking over Harry and Ernie, having worked with Jerry and not with Jim? Like, was it easier for you to do Harry because you knew Jerry Nelson? Uh, and was it difficult to do Ernie not hmm. knowing Jim? That's a very good question. I've been thinking about that one all uh, week. Harry's a much simpler. Harry did come easier to me. But I don't know if that, that that had anything to do with the fact that I knew Jerry and worked with him for many years. Um, I think it might be, well, it's two things. One, vocally, it's more in my wheelhouse. And secondly, Harry is a simpler character. What drives him he's, it, it is simpler than, than what drives Ernie. Ernie is capable of much, much, I think, more complex emotions and situations. And Harry is just a little, a little more, is a little simpler. Oh, yeah. um, in his character and where he comes from. And I think I think that my challenge in trying to recreate and maintain those characters uh, has more to do with who they are and not necessarily who originated them, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So how did you get to take on the roles of some of the uh, classic Muppet characters with the Muppets franchise, i.e. Robin, Statler, Lips, Link? Like, how did, how did that all happen? Because these are these they, are iconic Muppets. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, each one has a different a different story. Um, I think uh, we were recording something, was it for the Hollywood Bowl? 
it may have been it might have been the Hollywood Bowl show um they needed Statler and Waldorf and I just and I think it was the same with Link I and again Debbie McClellan was the head of Muppet Studios I just I just started I did my my Statler and my Link it's just like oh my god you should you should do that like okay and that was that was it that was basically it and then for 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 Lips um I was the only one there you know okay. Steve Steve was no longer with the Muppets and the other guys uh all had characters in the mayhem so there was nobody else to do lips in the band so that just kind of fell to me and at the time you know he didn't really have a voice so much i mean steve had done a little bit in the past but uh he was still kind of background at that point so that's how that happened uh robin was a gift um okay when when matt vogel became kermit he's like well i can't do both kermit and robin and he gave it some thought and he just he just told Debbie, he said, I want, I want Peter to be Robin. And he told me, he's like, you can do it, but it's in your wheelhouse. I think he'd be a great Robin. And, and then I worked with Matt a lot to, to find, you know, the voice and the character. Um, and he told me some tips that, that Jerry had given him and shared some, some video footage of, of Jerry talking about how he did Robin. And, you know, I get as close as I can. No one, uh, Jerry is irreplaceable. You, you, you just can't, <laughs> you just cannot replace him. Um, yeah. So that's how, I came to get those guys and then, and then, uh, but you know, my, I, it's, it's a huge responsibility and an honor to get to do these, these, uh, these uh, vintage characters, legacy characters, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it's not why I got into doing what I do. It's not what I love so much of what I found so appealing about the Muppets, but getting to do my own characters is really, and I think that's true for all of us. That's that's our joy, and so that's why I have a, a particular, particularly a lot of fun doing Joe from Legal, who is a, a weasel attorney, who's the Muppets attorney now. Mm -hmm. For anybody um, who doesn't know, that that's a brand new uh, character who's been like the mo more recent addition to uh, to the Muppets. He was in the streaming series uh, Muppets Now. Uh, and he's been in a lot of the uh, little video clips that they've done. If you yeah, don't, yeah, little YouTube, yeah. YouTube if, you don't, if you don't know the character, you've definitely heard his laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and my apologies uh, but well, that was, I mean that, well, it's, it's, it's more like ah, 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 ah. Dude, that's, that's pretty good that's pretty good impersonation right there thank you yeah and Joe from Legal grew, he grew out of a script in Muppets Now he was a one-off he was just a throwaway character and and Bill had just cast me to do this this a lawyer attorney and they brought one of these one of the old prairie dog puppets from the Muppet show and they gave him some round glasses and a three-piece suit and a briefcase and he just had a little disclaimer line. It was like one or two bits. And that was it. And Bill said to me, so what What kind of voice, what kind of character voice are you thinking for this guy? I said, well, I don't know. I was just thinking about that. And we looked at the puppet. I said, well, you could go with the obvious because he looks like a cute little guy. And you can do that, but that's not interesting. But he's an attorney. And and then, I, then it just came to me. It's like, oh, oh, what if I go totally against, you know, what you'd expect to come out of this little tiny cute thing? And go with this very deep series, which which was kind of a character that I've done just on my own, just playing around like Mr. White, this guy who just likes eats mayonnaise and, and white bread. <laughs> and he'll only eat white food. And uh, it's just the most boring person. And then the 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 obnoxious jokes and the laugh, I don't know where that came from. Mm -hmm. You know, Matt and I were just screwing around with uh, with Kermit and Joe from Legal and Piggy had this one line that was in this one scene. And it just, I, it just kind of came out of nowhere. It was just one of those magic little moments. And I just remember everyone just laughing so hard and like, and Bill's, his eyes got huge. Just like, you just created a new character and they started writing a bunch more for him. So that's great. Anyway, that was great fun. Yeah. That was organic. And I mean, that's, it's a lot, how a lot of the old characters came to be just the guys screwing around, you know? And, and I think the best character performance is going to come from the person that originated the character. We all do our best to try to recreate the magic and the spark uh, for these legacy characters, but the, I don't think they'll ever be quite as good as the originals. So that's mm -hmm. why it's, I think it's important for us to keep, you know, creating new characters and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, finding, finding more characters that come from within us. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were talking about lips uh, and of course he's become like basically the breakout character on the Muppets Mayhem, uh, the Disney Plus series. Uh, and, and like for and I've heard Matt talking about, you know, with Uncle Deadly, like Jerry's character that Jerry didn't even know what to do with him. And then suddenly Matt takes over and he's a star. And I've heard Steve talk about and Dave Goals as well, talking about lips. Steve 
just was wiggling this pup in the background was like there's ways I want to perform it but I don't know how and now we've got this great personality for lips where he is impactful among celebrities like Susanna Hoffs and uh, Paul Abdul and everybody um and yet not many people can really understand what he's saying but the people who are the closest to him how is lips's mumbling speech established wow well first let me say that uh uh, just as an, an addendum to what I was just saying before you asked that question, uh, is that there are exceptions. And and Uncle Deadly is one of those exceptions because Matt has taken a character that was, that, yeah, like you said, Jerry didn't quite know what to do with him and he had he wasn't that established and just completely grown this magnificent character who is so good and wonderful. But And uh, that's an exception to the rule of self. Because Matt's basically, I mean, Jerry originated the character, but man, Matt has just, anyway. He made him funnier. Been, well, he made him funnier, but also he just really fleshed him out as far as who he is and where he's coming from and what he wants in the world and and how he reacts to the people around him. And uh, it's it's just pure magic. For Lips, um, well, when Muppets, uh, Muppets Mayhem was um, in development, Bill took me aside again and said, you know, we're thinking that, I'm thinking that, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Lips is a mumbler. You know, he's got... He's just, you know, we can understand him. The guys, everybody understands him, but but what you hear is mumbling. And that's all. And it's like, oh, okay. All right, cool. That's great. That's funny. Okay. So then for months and months and months, I was like, what what does that sound like? Who who is the guy? And uh there's all different ways to mumble. I didn't want to be derivative of anything. You know, there's there's Kenny on South Park. There's um oh, oh, oh what's the guy King of the Hill? Um Boom Boomhauer, Boomhauser. Um, hour. I don't remember. But anyway, someone said, "Oh, yeah, he sounds like that." Him, yeah, that's real good. Uh, you know, I, originally, I, I, uh, the the person I knew, my favorite person who mumbled was my my car mechanic when I was in high school. Um, the wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> was dear a dear man named Sonny, and he had uh, a Toyota service center. It was specialized in Toyota, old Toyotas. It was called Sunny Service Center. And I just had the worst time understanding him. And when he told me what was wrong with the car, I'd call him, call him up, and he'd say, "Sean, sure, Sean, Sean, me. Oh, hi, Sam. Oh, oh, that Toyota's a good car. That's all that day. Anyway, so that was the first. That was my first inclination, and and it made the guys laugh. And but but the 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 King of the Hill character has kind of a Southern accent, and and when I did it, he didn't he didn't sound real bright and like well okay that's not maybe the way to go so i just started playing with all different different things and um i remember as we we're getting closer to production starting i called bill and it's like well here's a couple of things i'm thinking just to see if i was you know i was in the ballpark and he liked what i was doing uh and helped me work through a few things so ultimately decided that lip should have a deep voice because most of the guys in the band are, are higher register and uh and that he shouldn't have no no gravel, no kind of raspy thing going on because Teeth has that, and Floyd has that, and Animal has that. You know, they all have kind of a raspy thing. So it's okay. Lips has to be clear, and and deep, which is good because that because I have a deep voice, so I can do that. So I, his mumble kind of came uh, out of that. And then I was thinking about what sort of laugh he has, and I said, well, his laugh has to be incredibly high. It has to be completely opposite from his voice, and. Uh, and that, that's how, that's how, that's where he came from. And actually, hey, when we started, yeah, and when we started the show, um, you know, it was definitely very mumbly. And I had to. Bill had told me he's like, I wrote stuff for Lips's lines, but he said that's just a placeholder. Do whatever you want. Do do it. Put it through whatever Lips filter you have to. So I got to basically write my own lines in the space. But I had, but I had to know, of course, exactly what he was saying, even if you couldn't tell. And as we were shooting each episode, I started getting more and more clear. And I remember our director, Matt Sohn, saying, we just edited this, this episode and I can understand everything he's saying. I was like, oh, that's not good. Oh, I need to, I need to not do that. I, I started slipping into being really understandable. So uh, I, I made an adjustment, you know, mid-season. But uh, so it's a mix. Sometimes you can hear, understand exactly what he's saying. Other times it's like, no idea. So it's like a so porky pig find, thing. I had to find him. 
so so, yeah. so it's, yeah because like i'm i uh had one of one of my past guests was bob bergen who does porky pig i love I, yeah i know bob bob's a friend of okay Bob, awesome yeah. uh and yeah he was actually the first what when i started this back in 2020 of course you were one of the first people i invited and now finally here we are but bob was oh. actually the first person to uh to say yes he wasn't the first guest who came on but he was the first person who wow. said yes oh and, that's so cool and one thing i learned from him I don't think it was brought up on the show, but um, when he does the Porky Pig stutter, it's not in the script. So, like, for example, if it's uh, if Porky says, would you like me to walk your dog? He would do it as, would you like me to will we, will we, uh, walk your, uh, would you like me to walk your, uh, 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 your cocker spaniel? So there's an ad lib there, too. And so when you, when you were saying that the lines were written for lips and he mm -hmm. had been established by all of you as a mumbler and then Bill's like, OK, there's lines. But just the, like uh, I remember in the last one of Muppets Mayhem when he's doing the TED Talk and he says, and I can understand him saying, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. But it comes out, blah, 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 my TED Talk. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty, pretty funny concept to lips mm -hmm. giving a TED Talk. Mm -hmm. So uh, to wrap up the Muppets and Sesame Street talk before we uh, move on to Between the Lions and Big Big World, uh, do you have any celebrity stories from Muppets and Sesame Street that you'd like to share? Of course, being one of the main players, you've probably got several experiences. Several. Yeah, I've, wondered, I've met one or two famous people. I mean, <laughs> every, you know, it's, they're all, it's, it's great fun. It's always great fun working with, uh, with people, celebrities. Um, I, 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 not a good storyteller. No, um, just just that it's 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 always a thrill, and uh, there you know most famous people are really gracious and and uh, lovely to work with. Um, you know, I spent obviously spent the most time with uh, with Jason and Amy, and that was just a, an absolute thrill. And they're just lovely people, you know, and, and insanely talented. And you just always thinking to yourself, like, okay, I, I got to live up to their performances because these are like incredible, incredible actors. Um, so yeah, no, no, no tea, to, no tea to spill. <laughs> Fair just, enough. Uh, just it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm trying to think if there's anyone uh, we've worked with really, really recently. You know, it's been a while. We had, you know, we had the, the writer strike and the actor strike, so it's actually been. Well, we just started shooting Sesame Street season fifty five this week. Um, and we'll be working with celebrities as well. Of course, I can't tell you who, but uh, fair enough. But it's 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 been a while since I've worked with anybody. Mm. Well, uh, how was your strike, by the way? Wasn't that fun? You know what? It, uh, <laughs> I I've Alice and I just got married last July, so we were kind of we spent the whole strike together, and it was dreadful for work. Um, and you know, we went the, the picket lines and everything else. But we were just deliriously happy the whole time because um, I just got married. I'm still I'm still floating around on fluffy pink clouds. I'm really I'm really happy for you. I know I emailed you after I saw on uh, Facebook that you got married. But I am again, congratulations to both you and Alice. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So uh, going on to Between the Lions, like that's one of those shows that when I started this podcast, actually back in 2020, 2021, mm -hmm. uh, like early when I started, I got Chris Surf and then Norman Stiles. Chris helped me connect with Norman and then Norman connected me with Lou Berger. Um, nice. The nice little circle, huh? <laughs> and um, so to prepare for the one with Chris Surf, I was like, oh, I got to watch some Between the Lions. It's been years since I've seen Between the Lions. So I went everywhere, YouTube, Facebook, anywhere I could. And I found some full episodes on YouTube. And right off the bat, the uh, opening starts. Click, the little computer mouse is going through this. I tell this story a lot on Nostalgia Talk. All you listeners, if you're sick of hearing it, you know what to do, just skip over. So uh, I see Click going through the screen and I was like, okay, this, I, I recognize that character. Uh, the, there was a computer mouse on that show who did all the sponsors or something for it. And, uh, and, and then the theme song starts, hey, now, hey, wow. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, the theme song sounds familiar. It keeps getting more familiar to me. And then it gets really upbeat. And I swear to God, I started crying. <laughs> oh, it was, um, Oh my it god. It was so bad. Like, you know, it's a great theme, it's a great song. <laughs> it wasn't bad at all. I was the first time I'd watched it in like 10 years, and it's all looking familiar to me. Like 
most of the time i'm just listening to that theme song like you know how on streaming shows you can just skip the intro not me especially for between the lions i love that little wave of nostalgia that i got that day from watching that show just getting ready for my chat with chris surf and then i've had many more people from between the lions on the show pam and of course norman lou uh rick lyon um and of course noel mcneil who uh, told me that he, along with you, auditioned for Theo. Yeah, that's right. So how did yeah, it was... end up going to you? I don't know. Bad bad decision making, I guess. No, you know what? Uh, Kathy and Chris and Norman, it was, the, it was such a fun audition because it didn't even feel like an audition. It was just they got some friends together at Chris's, at Chris's house in Manhattan. And we just, uh, they did table reads and Kathy acted as kind of puppet captain. And she said, okay, so Peter, you read, you read for Lionel and someone else you read for Theo, you read for Cleo. And then, oh no, we'll read a different script and we'll switch it up. Now, now read for this character. And so we just kind of saw who fit with what. And uh, yeah. And then, and then after a couple of sessions of those of reading a bunch of scripts and switched and taking turns, everybody doing a different character, a few weeks later, we did uh, workshops actually with puppets and did the same kind of thing and tried out the different characters. And I really wanted to be Lionel. I was really gravitating towards Lionel, but uh, but they they wanted me to do Theo. So I did Theo. And I'm glad because I've had such a great time with him. Mm -hmm. Cheryl Blaylock told me that she actually auditioned for Cleo, uh, but mm -hmm. she's super glad that she didn't get it because she feels as if uh, Jen Barnhart is stronger than she is because they seem like really, really big puppets. Like, like, as I said, we only just hear, well, some of us anyway, only just hear the voice. We don't think about yeah. the physicality of it, but like, are, are those puppets actually like that heavy? They're, they are, but I mean, they're, they're really pretty light for their size. Okay. Um, it's kind of built out of lightweight material. However, that being said, yes, they're very heavy. <laughs> Of course they are. There's a lot of fur and, and, uh, and jewelry. My cats keep getting into your podcast here. Just jumping on. Or, uh, jumping That's all on good. Things. Okay. You, for you audio listeners, uh, there are no cats. Um, <laughs> uh, Unless you have one sitting next to you while you're listening to this. In that case, cats. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I lost my train of thought. Heavy. Yeah. They're pretty big and heavy for sure. They are. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, anything gets even something that weighs only a couple pounds gets really heavy. You hold it over your head long enough. Mm, fair enough. You know, like your arm would get like on the first show. I think I mentioned this to you. The first show I worked on right out of college. Um, it was like a short little YouTube series. I remember that. Yeah. Right. And I got yeah. to do a puppet oh. and uh, I had no lines with it. And mm -hmm. so if my, I'm not really ambidextrous, uh, but again, I had no lines. It didn't really matter what I was doing with that puppet. But if my arm, I had to stand behind that tarp for like a whole hour in the boiling hot sun. So if my arm got tired, I just switched it up. That got tired, switched it up. Yeah. Yeah. Can't quite do that with, with TV puppetry because my, my right arm is very, is very skilled and can do a lot of neat things. My left hand is useless. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you know sometimes sometimes in big group shots we have to do two puppets at once and <laughs> it's fun you can say which which puppet is on the person's left hand it's, it's the puppet that's like looking askew and crooked and leaning a little bit mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about uh, heavy puppets uh for the show it's a big big world you played the character of snook and that was a full-bodied puppet uh and for any of the listeners who don't know what i mean by full-bodied puppet like We've been talking about traditional hand puppets that you just hold up over your head, but then you've got characters like Big Bird, Snuffy, Barkley, Sweetums, and Sam the Robot, uh, which is a more obscure example. Uh, any yeah. classic Sesame Street fans know who Sam the Robot is. Uh, but for those characters, those are puppets that you wear. And Snook on It's a Big, Big World is one of those puppets. Uh, was it different uh, or how different was it for you to play a full bodied character instead of just holding it up over your head? Yeah, it's uh, it's different and it's the same. Um, okay. It's the same in that, you know, the technique is the same as far as lip sync and eye focus and expression and communicating emotion and ideas and thoughts. It's different in that instead of just using your shoulder or your arm, wrist and fingers, it's your entire body. You, you take this and put it in your whole body. And it was so fun, incredibly difficult and challenging and hot and exhausting, but really fun. I, and in, with Snook in particular, um, 
you know, maybe not as much on the show when we were actually filming it because it was all in blue screen and we're on an elevated stage. But uh, I, I had a couple of opportunities to do Snook in the real world and, and make appearances. And they put a little tiny camera in his forehead and so he could look at people and I could see where I was going because there's no way to see through that fur. But what was really fun, what the most fun I had with Snook was when I got to perform him live and and you know get down low with little kids or lie on the floor or roll around on the floor i could be so physical with that puppet and it was just hugely fun i mean really i loved uh the the ability to make this thing seem alive really alive and do all the things that a living talking giant sloth could do <laughs> living breathing talking dancing singing giant sloth mm -hmm. I was telling uh, really Mitchell, fun. I was telling Mitchell that Snook was a lot like Bear and uh, in uh, return, both of those characters are very much like uh, Mr. Rogers. Mm, yeah, right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the calm center of the storm. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. You know, like just uh, right, right away. Uh, uh, as soon as uh, the theme song ends, one of those characters is like, oh, hello. Uh, I went to uh, a mental health center uh, yesterday and they told us that if anybody walks through that door, even if it's just for a microsecond, somebody will say hello. And even after that little short period of time, no matter how long they've been there, they get a goodbye. Maybe not from the same person, but they will get greeted and they will uh, get noticed when they take off. So that and, that and like very similar to Snook and Bear and Mr. Rogers, it's a very welcoming community. Yeah, that that was that's great. That's really great. That was a rule that Mitchell had for on Bear. I think for all his shows, if someone comes in, you say hi, and you say the person's name, and when they leave, you say okay, bye, and you say their name. It's like we have to have that every time. Don't ever, don't ever miss that part. It's like okay, and that's it became a, a thing. That's and wonderful. I love it. And also, it helps the audience uh, repeat learn the, who the characters are and learn their names if you hear them multiple times, especially children. I should say especially children, especially adults. I don't know who the characters are in the shows I watch because they don't say their names enough. Fair enough. Uh, so let's wrap it up with a fan question. I, uh, When I announced this on Nostalgia Talk social media, I asked listeners if they had any questions that they'd like to ask. And so, so uh, this one comes from, this is a fan question from a fellow by the name of Anthony Thompson. Yeah. And oh, you know him? I mean, I know that name. Why do I know? Why do I know Anthony Thompson? He may have, uh, he may have written me questions himself. Okay. Well, he, I see his name on Nostalgia Talk social media a lot, and the comments that he sends are just so nice. And like, there, there, a lot of them are uh, James. I love how passionate you are about the Muppets. And uh, Anthony, I know you and I have never met, but again, I do appreciate that. I your uh, generosity and. Um, uh, your awareness for, I don't want to say for my passion, but for all of our passions in Muppets on all, for all Muppet fans. Like we're all here for a reason. We're a group of people that uh, enjoy the stuff. And of course, you guys as listeners, you come back to hear uh, me chat with not just people at Muppets, but like I've interviewed one of the kids from Home Alone. I've interviewed Austin Pendleton. Uh, I've talked to, uh, who else have I had on the show? The voice of Donald Duck. Uh, and you know, like, the, and like, these are of course iconic things for a lot of us uh and you know you guys love coming here coming back here when i post a video and chatting about it anyway so anthony's question is about the muppets abc show and it is and i think this is something you and i were talking about once when that show started was it odd being one of the core puppeteers for the sitcom yet not having your own character until glory estefan was introduced yes it was okay yes it was it felt it felt very strange and uh and I did feel like I was missing out a bit. And I was bummed, you know, I was bummed that, that Walter wasn't a part of it. And then, you know, some of us had this whole other theory that, well, who's behind the camera? Oh, it's Walter. Walter's shooting the documentary. You know? <laughs> that sounds like something Walter would do. Like he could be like a vlogger. Exactly. That's why, that's why he's not there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was strange. And that's why it was so, and you know, it's like I was, had all this bottled up creativity because I wanted to play and you know I was I was doubling for Eric a lot if Fozzie and Piggy were in the same scene and this is what I've done for many many years uh for Eric um is, is double his characters and then he would you know, do the voice live or, or, or dub it later so when I finally got to do this this cute little baby penguin it was like yes so, so I was just hamming it up uh a lot but it was that was fun finally getting to do 
And was uh, that one? And was was that one that you was that one that you auditioned for, or was it one that was no, like no, 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 no. That was okay. just one. It was written, and Bill's like, "Okay, you're gonna do the penguin." Yeah, no, at least it gives you a character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, and it was just a one-off, you know, was, and and it was so cute. Everybody loved it, so they wrote it into other episodes. Mm -hmm. um, so Gloria Stefan was around for more than just the one show she was originally written for. Mm -hmm. Kind of similar to the Joe from Legal story, just this. And that's and again getting back to the thing when we when we do these new series and, and get to create new characters that's it's just the best it's so it's so fun and satisfying mm -hmm. and, what's and nice people usually identify I mean like them too it's something new that comes from one of us and and what's really nice about that with uh, Muppets Mayhem of course is that um, you know we got a few new characters in addition to these classic ones and they were performed by people who don't get to perform with the Disney Muppets a lot. I'm referring to Dr. Teeth's parents, of course, uh, mm -hmm. David Absolutely. and Stephanie yeah. doing those. And I, and I think this was, if I'm not mistaken, this was David's first big Muppet character. That's huge for him. Cause I, I, I know David, I know yeah. him as a puppet builder. So. Yeah. That was a very, very big deal. That's right. Hi, hi David. If you're listening. <laughs> He's busy with his, with his child. He has no time to listen to things. Probably. Got a family to raise now. Yes. <laughs> well, that's uh, all I've got here. Is there anything else you want to say to finish up? Uh, thanks for having me. I'm glad we finally got to do this after being asked to do it so long ago. You finally got me, James. You got me. Yes. Right where you want me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say it was great to get to have the opportunity to chat with you again. Of course, last time it was you and your family and my family as well. Uh, now it's just you and me, buddy. Yep. Mm -hmm. And to all you listeners, uh, thanks for tuning in for the first Nostalgia Talk of 2024. Um, I'm sorry it was a little bit uh, delayed because, uh, you know, it's been a month since the last one. Of course, you know, Christmas got busy. This year has uh, already right off the bat. January this year has been a little crazy for me, too, in many, many different ways. Um, Peter and I were talking about that right before I started recording uh but i'm back and uh i've been communicating with uh, people to come on the show that have yet to be announced some of those that were on hold because of the sag aftra strikes uh so uh yeah there'll be stuff uh, on the way for 2024 so in the meantime if you want to hear who's going to be coming on nostalgia talk you guys know where to go facebook.com slash nostalgia talk youtube and twitter.com slash nostalgia talk yt that is where all guest announcements are going to be if you want to hear any of those so I will see you on the next Nostalgia Talk. Till then, peace out. Take care, people. <laughs>